So our next speaker, Lynn, will tell the story of how the United States government unfortunately uh, won the court case recently against her son, Ross, um, the now convicted so-called uh, creator of the Silk Road, which for, as far as what I can tell, it's basically it was a website that facilitated trade just like eBay or similar to it. Um, the only major difference being that, you know, from eBay to Silk Road is that most of the items and the services that Silk Road sold were not officially approved by the federal government of the United States. Um, I had the pleasure of eating breakfast this morning with Lens. That was really kind of cool. Uh, which is another really cool thing about Liberty Forum. You can just have breakfast with these awesome, uh, awesome people. Uh, one of the things she said about the conference was that it was very therapeutic for her to be here with you guys. So uh, she basically wants to thank you guys for coming out and, and uh, supporting her. Um, I'm not going to say I'm a Bitcoin expert or on Ross's trial, but I've definitely read up on both. And uh, for me, this is a story about voluntary exchange versus force of liberty versus government, and also about how much a mother loves her son. And, you know, just think about how much you love your parents. If you're a parent out there, think about how much you love your kids. And uh, do your best to truly welcome her to the stage, Lynn Albrecht. Yeah, it really is great to be here. Um, I'm suffering from post-traumatic trial syndrome, and uh, it is therapeutic. It really has been great. Um, yeah, because I'm Ross Ulbricht's mother, I had a front row seat at what the great Nick Gillespie called the most important trial in America. Um, it certainly was a landmark case for the digital age. Unfortunately, only one side got its day in court. Uh, Forbes called it the trial that wasn't. A blogger called it performance art. Uh, it certainly wasn't a level, fair playing field like I thought trials were supposed to be. You know, whatever you think about Ross, you know, whether you think he was rightly convicted, wrongly convicted, a hero, a villain, I think, I hope, we can all agree that he will let all of us deserve a fair trial and he didn't get one. Evidence uh, in his favor was suppressed. Defense witnesses were blocked. His attorney was hamstrung and unable to effectively cross-examine to establish reasonable doubt. Now, the deck was stacked against Ross even before he went into court in many ways. One of them was that um, one of the most powerful politicians in the United States had made the Silk Road his personal project and was pushing for a conviction. Chuck Schumer publicly convicted Ross before trial, before any evidence, in an open letter to Eric Holder saying, hey, congratulations, DOJ, you got your man. I'm like, uh, what happened to innocent until proven guilty? So the deck was stacked. The first um, day of trial, there were people out in front of the courthouse exercising their First Amendment rights, questioning how a website host could be facing potentially a life sentence. Inside, it was going pretty much how I expected the first day. The prosecutors got up there and um, did their, you know, bashing, and they're going, that man over there. They love to point. I noticed that in the bail hearing. They just, that man. They're really into drama. And then Ross's attorney got up and basically dropped a bombshell. And he said, well, yeah, Ross did actually create the Silk Road as a free market, open market experiment. But then he got out a few months later and passed it on to someone else. Down the road, actually a couple of years down the road, that someone else learned that law enforcement was closing in and needed a fall guy and set Ross up. Now, this wasn't some fairy tale that the defense had come up with. This came out of the government's own evidence, in, out of their 3,500 material that was dumped on the defense 
um, 10 days before trial. It was 7,500 pages. That's like reading through the Obamacare bill more than three times in less than 10 days. But Ross and his attorneys did it, and, this, and they found evidence to support what Dreitel was saying in court. Next came the first witness, who is uh, Department of Homeland Security, Jared Driegan, special agent. He had spent thousands of hours and two years on the Silk Road website undercover as um, a high-ranking administrator named Cirrus. And during that time, he, um, okay, well, uh, let me go back. He was first questioned by Saren Turner, the lead prosecutor, about details about Silk Road, answered very predictably, very robotically, methodically, and this went on for hours and hours. Just a tip, if you ever have insomnia, get a recording of a prosecutor questioning government agent. It will solve your problem. No worries. But Dreytel woke everybody up with his cross-examination of this witness. And um, basically what came out of it was that Dreyagin, in his two years and thousands of hours, had built a substantial case, not against Ross, who he'd never heard of before the arrest, but against someone else, Mark Carpellis, who was uh, owner of the failed Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox. And um, he documented, this, this agent documented twice in sworn affidavits that he had probable cause to think that Mark Carpellis was DPR and was running Silk Road, and he sought a warrant for his, uh, for his, a warrant for his email and to be able to continue his investigation. And he felt like he was getting close, and he asked other agencies, hey, don't tip him off, I'm almost there. I think I've got my man. Well, the problem was there was a lot of competition among agencies to get this prize, to get DPR. The government already had the server, the Silk Road server, for three months with no arrest. That didn't look good. They had a U.S. senator breathing down their neck, and they wanted to get somebody that could be DPR. And so what happened is his investigation, they pulled the rug out from under it, this other agency in Baltimore, also Homeland Security in Baltimore, by tipping off Car Carpellis by seizing $2.9 million out of his account. I mean, that'll get your attention, right? And so Carpellis was alerted. Duryagin was felt undermined. He was quite upset about it. He documented that in a chronology that, um, of, the, of the case. He felt sabotaged. Well, it gets even more interesting because Carpellis' lawyers had a meeting with the Baltimore DHS agency, and they said, look, you back off our client, Carpellis, don't charge him with any financial crimes, and we'll give you a name. We'll give you DPR. Now, we don't know what else transpired at that meeting. What we do know is that two weeks later, Ross was arrested, and Carpellis has never been charged with anything. And I d it, it looks like Duryagin wasn't convinced because he kept investigating him for a while afterwards. Well, at this point, everyone was on the edge of their seats, like, okay, tell us more. This is really, you know, this is way more interesting than going through details, like from the prosecutor. Let's, let's hear the rest of the story. But the prosecutor leapt up. It's like, whoa, stop, objection, objection. Really didn't want any more of this to come out. The judge actually disagreed with that, and um, he kept persisting. She, she argued a bit, and then decided to just pretty much put, put everything to a stop, send the jury home an hour early, stop the cross-examination, hold the witness over till the next week so the cross-examination could continue. And she said this was, she wanted to do this to hear the arguments. She said it was in the interest of justice. So the thing is, the prosecution had one narrative, and that was one DPR, nobody else, only Ross. And um, this was sounding like maybe there was another suspect, and he ha they had to suppress that. 
In addition, Duryagan testified that not only did he, he suspect Carpellis at some time, but there were other suspects he had, and he also felt like multiple people were using the DPR handle during the time he was on there. So Sarah Turner was, seemed very panicked. And um, this is from his own evidence with his own agent. The defense hadn't brought this. This is their stuff. And the defense attorney, Joshua Dreytel, countered. He goes, look, this is core Brady. And he's talking about the Brady rule, which is saying you cannot suppress evidence favorable to a defendant. He said it's core Brady. And the judge actually agreed. And then the prosecutor goes, well, Your Honor, they're, they're arguing that someone else is DPR. And at this, there was actual laughter in the gallery because uh, some lawyers were sitting behind us because like, yeah, that, that's what they're doing. And the judge said, well, you know, how else do you do it? And um, he goes, well, I haven't had a chance to talk with the witness yet. And she's like, uh, you're not allowed to talk to the witness while an examination is pending. And I'm like, what was he going to say to him? I don't know. But anyway, she said that if an agent pursued someone other than the defendant, it was not only highly relevant, highly relevant but it was directly relevant. She said how he arrived at that conclusion was obviously relevant, that the agent believed there was probable cause was clearly relevant, that the agent believed somebody else might be DPR is obviously highly relevant, that an alternative suspect strikes me as in the heartland of the defense, and the fact that Carpellis could, could be a DPR had come out in spades. These are quotes that you can read them in the transcripts of the, of the trial. When the prosecution persisted in arguing, she said, that cat's out of the bag and court adjourned. That was Thursday, court reconvened on Tuesday and seemed to have done a complete 180 and was now playing by different rules. Now, Duryagan's beliefs were irrelevant. Key parts of the testimony was stricken. The jury was instructed to disregard what they had heard from him the previous week. And of course, it couldn't be used in the summation, the defense's summation at the end. The court flagged the objections that should have been made, according to the court, and retroactively sustained them And strict boundaries were set that were in place from then on. Such questions as, did you suspect Mark Carpellis? Off limits. Did you believe Mark, Car did you believe Mark Carpellis was DPR? Off limits. Do you suspect that Mark Carpellis operated Silk Road? Off limits. The Carpellis offer to provide DPR's name, not relevant. So, whoops, not relevant. So, there's day one on the left, day, I mean, excuse me, day three of court on the left, and day four on the right. What a difference a week makes, weekend makes. So now, the cat was back in the bag. The reason the court gave, well, this alternate DPR thing, it might confuse the jury. Another suspect might confuse them. Now, I was confused because I thought a jury was supposed to get all the evidence and then make an impartial decision based on that. So going forward, the, the um, defense was tethered to a very narrow path that basically had to follow the prosecution's narrative. Joshua Dreytel, Ross's lawyer, explained to me that the cross-examination is supposed to be able to explore context, go out in that field, get underneath the surface of the direct questioning. Yes, there are limitations, but he was put on an extremely short leash and restricted very tightly to that path. He told me, 
we had strong issues, it would have altered the outcome of the trial. Basically, the government was arguing that its own witness was unreliable, that he, even what he said under oath in sworn affidavits, but they could submit endless chats um, that were unauthenticated. Basically, the jury was allowed to hear what they wanted them to hear, a very strict narrative. Joshua Dreytel submitted a seven-page letter objecting to this, saying it was a violation of due process rights. No avail. Well, the, prosecu the prosecution breathed a sigh of relief, and they were going to make sure that nothing like that slipped in again. And so Sarah Turner became an objection machine. This is from Forbes. But I wasn't the only one to notice it. He was jumping up and down like a jack-in-the-box, objection, objection, and we counted it, 114 objections that day. It was totally interrupted the flow, it made it very difficult, if impossible, for the jury to follow the cross-examination. Couldn't connect the dots, very difficult. You know, when only one side of a story is told, it's easy to make anything sound convincing. You know, I think we know that from our own lives. When you cherry pick certain things and you make sure other things aren't told, it's not the truth, it's not the whole truth. And it makes me wonder, what's the government so afraid of that we're gonna find out? What are they hiding? From then on, our lawyer said, it was like the Titanic before it went under. This, it tilted the playing field to the point there was no way to uh, crawl up that deck. Basically, the defense was underwater, or as Forbes put it, completely derailed. Well, Josh Traytel kept on trying. He kept fending off objections, uh, trying to question uh, witnesses about evidence, gathering um, how, you know, the point he brought up how the laptop crashed in the middle of their analysis, so they couldn't copy what was in the memory. Um, you know, these other relevant questions were blocked. He asked uh, FBA, FBI agent Thomas Kiernan about an experiment he did with the Linux kernel that's an essential part of the operating system and wasn't permitted to, and the judge said, her quote was, leave the kernel. And the court said, well, you can call your own expert, your own computer expert. At that point, Josh Dreytel called for a mistrial because he wasn't allowed to question when he should have been, he said, and because by saying the defense can call their own witness, it puts the burden of proof where it doesn't belong. It puts it on the defense. It's the government's burden of proof, not the defense. <laughs> Mistrial denied. He questioned IRS agent Gary Alford um, about internet research he had done, he, and, and he had sworn to things in, in sworn statements he had signed and about who else he suspected besides Ross, about how he gathered his information. Well, and also he wanted to get into positive things he had found out about Ross in his, um, his research. Well, the positive things were t called hearsay, and everything else, well, that, that wasn't hearsay. In addition, documents and exhibits that the defense wanted, submitted were denied while the government added dozens throughout the trial. So Draytel said, okay, you know, I, if you won't let me use mine, let me use theirs, but I'll just go to a different section. And no, can't do that. And he goes, you know, I just want equivalency. That's all I'm asking. He said that in court. There was also Bitcoin witness Eliam Yum, who was at XFBI, now working with, to, with in the private sector at a company called FTI. You know, Bitcoin knowledge is not genetic, so just because I'm Ross's mother, I'm not particularly uh, qualified to comment on his, his testimony, so I want Roger Ver to do it for me. And Roger's basically saying, they either don't understand it or they're lying. Now, Yum worked on uh, one case before this one, 
He didn't even do most of the work on this one. He did less than half, half of it. And um, he didn't document his procedures. And his company was paid, with your tax money, $55,000 for this testimony and research. I saw him leaving the uh, courtroom and high-five another agent. Hey. And I'm like, yeah, I'd high-five too if I was making that kind of money. And as was typical in this case, in the court, the defense was only notified last minute about this testimony. They didn't have time to analyze it. It was very complex. So Joshua Draytel moved to strike it and because they didn't get any notice. He said, could I have two hours just to look it over? No. So he moved to strike it, and um, that was denied. And also the fact that the work was done, most of the work was done by somebody else. So at this point, we were really ready for the defense to have its turn and its witnesses. And tragically, it was a disastrous non-event. We, we wanted to bring um, Andreas Antonopoulos. Here he is testifying at the. Uh, Canadian Senate about Bitcoin to refute Young's uh, Bitcoin explanation and they didn't allow it. The court did not allow it. Reason? You know, the jury understands Bitcoin just fine. This is unnecessary. This is irrelevant. Josh moved for a mistrial again. Denied. And I read the due process clause. It says you have a right to call witnesses. Then, you know, remember when I said, she said, call your own uh, computer witness. So, we did. Oh, blocked. Sorry. <laughs> blocked. Then we tried the computer witness. Um, Stephen Bellavin from Columbia University. He was also blocked. The rationale there? This case doesn't require specialized computer knowledge, technical knowledge. So he could have challenged the improper laptop investigation. He could have explained other technical issues, like the lack of security of open ports, how timestamps can be changed, why complex technology behind um, hidden websites makes it almost impossible to prove anything but the jury didn't get a chance to hear that. Instead, they got an avalanche of digital material, chats, emails, screenshots, that are impossible to authenticate. They're vulnerable to hacking, manipulation, editing, faking. On the real life side, the government had one witness that actually testified about Ross himself, and that was Richard Bates, he was testifying in exchange for not going to prison himself. He had helped program, he said, uh, Silk Road in its infancy. And he, Dr Joshua Draytel had him read his agreement with the government, and it was that he would testify as per specific instructions and control of the United States. I translate that as saying he was specifically told how to testify and if he didn't, he, f he risked going to prison. But even so, he testified that Ross told him in 2011 that he had sold the site. Now, there were, there were witnesses that were quite, um, it was quite apparent they weren't there. They were, um, by their absence, it was obvious. One of them was that there was no one they came forward to say that Ross Ulbricht had hurt them in any way, that they were a victim, that he had harmed them. You know, I've been reading the Federal Prison Guidebook, my new reading material, and they talk about victims. They talk about making restitution. I'm like, no one showed up to say they were a victim. Another very obvious absence was uh, the lead investigator on the case, Christopher Tarbell. He now works with the Bitcoin guy, Yum, at that very well-paying FTI place. Here he is on 60 Minutes Australia talking about, oh, what a thrill it was to arrest Ross. He goes, 
yeah, it was better than anything you can get on Silk Road. And I'm like, oh, really? Are you talking from experience? So here he is. He's a lead investigator. He signed the criminal complaint. He was in charge of Ross's arrest. And he claimed he found the Silk Road server. And he was barely mentioned in the trial. And about that claim, that how he found the server, um, it, it was debunked worldwide by experts. They called it gibberish, impossible, a lie, inconsistent with reality. Cybersecurity expert Nicholas Weaver said his story didn't even mesh with the FBI's actual evidence. But Tarbell was like, well, darn, I didn't save my work. I don't have any documentation to prove what I said. And I'm like, is this like digital, the dog ate my homework, most unbelievable excuse ever? Um, so despite his key role, he was erased. And of course, that meant that the defense did not have an opportunity to cross-examine him about the server, about his investigation, nothing. Let's just forget about him. Let's forget about the server. Another witness who was absent was Andrew Michael Jones, who was known on Silk Road as Inigo. He was um, the longest serving administrator of the site, and he's now in custody. And he was on the witness list, but they yanked him. And Joshua Dreitel wanted to just present the jury with a small slice of information from the evidence. And what it was, was that Inigo testified, or told the government, that in August 2013, he was communicating with DPR, and they had established a digital handshake to confirm that they were actually talking to who they thought they were talking to, because of course, no one knows who's actually on the internet, who's behind these identities. And when he presented that um, uh, handshake, that prompt, DPR didn't know the answer. So it wasn't the same person. The, the, the prosecution blocked that. Even that little thing that might indicate that there was more than one DPR, the jury could not hear that. Now, on the subject of multiple DPRs, the government's own evidence shows that they suspected multiple DPRs. Alex Winner, whose um, documentary Deep Web is about to premiere, he told me he had interviewed people deep inside Silk Web, including one of the architects of the site. And he told me that they all clearly were positive that, that they had dealt with many people calling themselves DPR over time. There were different ages, different personalities, different attitudes. They were obviously different people. And they said that was necessary. Everything had to you know, run through this DPR um, persona, and it was just too much for one person to possibly do. One of them said, well, he was having a dispute with one DPR, and he said, well, I know, I know the uh, senior DPR. Go, go ask him if it's OK. And he came back and said, oh, yeah, it's OK, DPR. They all also firmly believe that the DPR who wrote about freedom, nonviolence, was absolutely not the same DPR who did big drug, drug deals and um, allegedly arranged murder for hire. They don't, they're sure it's not the same DPR. Amir Taki told me himself that he chatted with DPR in the early days, had a great connection, long chat, and then a couple years later, chatted with DPR again. He said it wasn't the same person. I'm sure it wasn't. He didn't even remember the conversation, and he just wasn't, he wasn't uh, the same guy. He, um, and he wasn't nearly as much fun either. But you know, uh, the, again, the government was not going to let any of that idea of more than one DPR out in the courtroom. They censored other things too. Another thing that was not, the, the jury was not allowed to see was that Ross has a loving family who cares about him? Because I guess that just doesn't fit the, 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 the image. So during trial, uh, in the beginning, the lawyers would go up to what's called a sidebar, 
And during that time, you know, Ross would turn around, look at us, smile, we'd kind of connect. You know, we don't get to see him much. It was nice. Well, no, 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 that cannot be allowed. And the court blocked him from being able to turn around and do that while a jury was in the room. So let's just pretend that he doesn't have a family. He's, you know, that gets erased. Another thing that was blocked from trial is um, Ross's libertarian, nonviolent philosophy that was not allowed to be mentioned. You know, I guess this doesn't sound like a kingpin or someone who have, would have people killed either. So that doesn't fit. Even the Silk Road site was distorted, and I'm not here to defend it, but you would have thought, sitting in that courtroom, that it was strictly heroin, hard drugs, and with some cyanide thrown in. I don't remember them mentioning marijuana or anything legal, non-drug items, the philosophy, the drug harm reduction uh, forum, the book club, nothing. Just hard drugs, heroin, basically. And again, I'm not saying those weren't sold on it. I'm just saying that this was a carefully crafted, censored presentation by the prosecution. And the picture they wanted to paint was Ross as one and only single DPR who was a ruthless kingpin motivated by power and money who would do anything to defend his empire. That was the picture that the jury, they wanted the jury to see. And you know, murder for hire comes in real handy with that. Now, Ross wasn't charged with that. He was not charged. None of the counts are for murder for hire. But they acted as if he was. They spent the whole last day of trial on it. Now, that's going to totally confuse it and influence a jury. And the media, by the way, they love that stuff. One journalist said, oh, Ross was convicted for murder for hire. And I'm like, well, it's kind of hard to be convicted if you haven't been charged. But that's, you know, that's sensationalistic. That's what, you know, gets spread around. So the, if there isn't any solid evidence, you know, the kind we're supposed to have, or even flimsy evidence, digital evidence, really, why didn't they charge, charge him with it if they had this evidence? No charge or real proof required. And about those chats, because I think they sound pretty phony, one commenter said, this conversation feels like a badly scripted CSI episode. And another one wrote, the chats reek of politeness, perfect spelling, per few typos, and too much description. And I would add, perfect capitalization, no abbreviations. I went back after reading that chat and looked over chats and emails that Ross had, we had written together. I could barely find a capital letter. Plenty of typos, <laughs> abbreviations. The commenter continued, he said, why does it seem like this, it's the same person writing to himself? Grammar and other sentencing structure seem strangely alike. Was this a setup? Draytail says those chats reek of fabrication, but that's what was presented to the jury, not the peaceful, Nonviolent Ross Ulbricht, the real Ross. No, they didn't get to see that. Now I have other questions that come up. For example, how do you explain if Ross is uh, DPR, the one and only, how did he manage to run this big empire off grid in the Costa Rican rainforest in the middle of nowhere with internet that barely functioned or didn't most of the time? I know he was there because he was with me. Was he, was he doing this from the jungle? No explanation. Or how about the three files that were created on his laptop after his arrest? Where'd those come from? Or the fact that DPR posted on the Silk Road forum six days after his arrest. Who was that? You know, I don't know. A lot of things don't add up. But as Josh Draytel said, the, the prosecution's narrative is just a little too convenient. Well, while these questions are intriguing, you know, it's really too late. Ross has been convicted. He faces sentencing on May 15th. 
I've been told by two lawyers that prosecutors put, typically push for the maximum because it looks good on their resume. What we're talking about here is the equivalent of a life sentence. Ross said, I visited him last week, he said, well, you know, a life sentence is basically a death sentence. Either way, you die in prison, just one takes longer. This is based on easily manipulated evidence that's unauthenticated. We're just praying for mercy at the sentencing. The least, he, the, the least he can get is 20 years. So why is this important going forward? Well, because precedent is going to be set with this case. And precedent influences future cases, which influences law, and law impacts all of us. Over time, rules are changed, and constitutional protections are weakened, and the government expands. Joshua Dreitel explained it to me. He said, you know, precedent from a major case will trickle down very quickly, very easily into ordinary cases, and before you know it, it's all just kind of the way it is. He said it's traditional for the government to use high-profile cases to make bad law. So what precedent has been set here? Well, whether or not you believe the government's digital evidence, the fact is that the standard of evidence has been drastically lowered. Now, they don't have to pro provide solid evidence of a crime or authenticate where it came from to put someone in prison. They just need chats, emails, and screenshots. Digital evidence, by its nature, lacks integrity and is easily faked. I mean, that, the courts have, has, have said that. It's impossible to prove who is really behind a computer screen, who really wrote an email, who really wrote a chat. They're tiny, easily planted files. An agent, um, an FBI agent at the trial, explained that at, in depth. So I learned the other day at breakfast that the government actually has a lower standard of evidence than mortgage companies. Because the person I was eating with said, yeah, my mortgage company won't accept a screenshot of my bank statement. But the government can use a, bank, uh, a screenshot to put somebody in a cage for decades? And a bank statement you can authenticate. These you can't. Another um, thing that's impacted and is basically a precedent is, well, the Fourth Amendment apparently doesn't apply to the digital age, even though Supreme Court rulings have said it does. Now, the thing, they did have a warrant for Ross's laptop, but a warrant requires specific, a specific target. It forbids a general warrant where you can just go rummaging around to see what you can find. This goes back to American Revolution, when the colonists were abused by the British, where they'd invade their houses and rummage through them. It was one of the things that sparked the revolution and was one of the, the reason they wrote the Fourth Amendment. So, you know, the Fourth Amendment says, we have a right to be secure in our persons, houses, papers, and effects and that warrants must particularly describe what is to be searched and seized. Well, the warrants they used in Ross's case were general warrants. They had no limits. They just went on a fishing expedition in his laptop, Facebook, Gmail, uh, emails. Now, if they had done, gone into his house and done this in his desk drawers or his file cabinets, it would be clearly unconstitutional. But because it's digital, it's not? I mean, I don't get it. If I write a letter on a laptop, it's not protected by the Fourth Amendment, but if I write it on a piece of paper, it is? This is a, an important question going forward in the digital age, because we keep our lives on our computers and our phones. There's also a Fourth Amendment question of whether the United States has the right to search and seize a server in a foreign country without a warrant which is what happened with the Silk Road server, or even hack into it. 
The government goes, yeah, we can. I mean, even if we somehow hacked into it, we can do that. They put people in prison for doing that. Now, if, as many experts have said, the FBI explanation of how they found the server isn't true, how did they find it? And also, a lot of the uh, things they said about Ross, how'd they find that? We don't know. We do know that the NSA spies on people illegally and that they supply the Depart uh, Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, with information who supplies it to law enforcement. That, that has been revealed. And Tor is one of their main targets. And then they cover up the illegal investigation with another story to explain how they, they got where they got. And that's called parallel construction. Hani Fakuri of the Electronic Frontier Foundation calls it investigation laundering. So they have these odd lucky breaks. Ooh, you know, we found this. Hmm, not sure how, um, you know, bogus explanations of how they found the server. And it, it, it makes you wonder, how did they? Joshua Dreytel was blocked from questioning the investigation and whether it, was le whether it was legal or authentic. So we don't know. There's one other um, precedent I'd like to talk about, which is transferred intent. And that's when you make one person responsible for the actions of another. In this case, a website host responsible for cr crimes uh, done on the site by someone else. And this precedent, it, you can argue, opens the way for vulnerability for other web hosts to be criminally liable. And you can say, well, you know, that was Silk Road, it was blatant, it was drugs. Well, tell that to Federal Express. Federal Express is being, is being, has been indicted by the federal government for drug trafficking and money laundering because people used FedEx to send illegal pharmaceuticals. That's transferred intent, and it expands how many of us can become criminals. This is a um, statue that's in the foyer of the courtroom. I passed it every day going into trial. And I would think, I hope it's not just a statue. I hope that there is the spirit of justice here. And I've just spent all this time talking about some, just some of the things that were unfair. And by the end, I, I had come to feel that it was just a beautifully crafted hunk of bronze. So the trial is over, but the fight is not. About the truth of the story, I think we know a tip of a very big iceberg. Um, kind of breaks my heart that Ross told me before the trial, he said, oh, I, I'm going to be acquitted. He was sure he was going to be free because he knew some of what should have come out. I don't know what it is, but I do know that Ross deserved his day in court like we all do, and that it's essential to preserve the right to a fair trial, and that the precedent set in this case expand government power and threaten our liberty. Now, we're going to continue to fight, and Ross will appeal. And I, hopefully, the appeal will reverse these precedents and get Ross out of that place at the same time. It's a long, hard, expensive fight, and uh, we could use some help. Um, please visit our website, freeross.org, if you'd like to help or learn more. And um, do what you can. And I'm not saying it just for me or for Ross, but to push back at um, this kind of government expansion and abuse. Oh, and we also have t-shirts and tote bags in the hall. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, we would welcome your participation. Thank you.